welcome uh, to our talk. So we uh, will have several changes in the talk because we will uh, talk about uh, two things here and that is the social and the uh, technical or te technological challenges in the development of voice assistants. I will briefly uh, give you an overview of uh, what we're going to talk about and then I will hand over to Sven for the first part of the social uh, challenges. Um, so what we want to talk about is uh, first, what is the current acceptance of uh, voice assistance? And uh, what is related to that are the technical challenges of recognition accuracy or recognition rate uh, of the speech recognition and also of the prosody. Uh, and, and that is prosody that is used by the synthesis and prosody uh, that is analyzed uh, uh, during the recognition. So then we will discuss, uh, yeah, do we trust uh, the voice assistants as they are now and maybe what has to be done to, to improve uh, trustworthiness. Uh, then I will talk about uh, personalized voices. That's a technical challenge again. So and uh, for this, I argue we need more flexible synthesis uh, than we currently have. Um, then Sven will talk about uh, a, a problem of these uh, voice assistants and that is uh, potential distraction potentially all the time, uh, like smartphones for some people. And uh, finally, I will uh, go a little in the future and talk about uh, confidential silent communication and commu communication strong background noise. So how can we then still use these uh, voice assistants? And as a starter, I would present to you a video where the future has been uh, a little bit uh, predicted kind of, especially uh, uh, regarding voice assistance for the elderly people, because that is still a big challenge. And uh, some of the challenges and potential solutions predicted in that video uh, will also be addressed by us. So, have a look. The new Amazon Echo has everyone asking Alexa for help. Alexa, what time is it? What the hell is wrong with this blasted thing? I'm mad. But the latest technology isn't always easy to use for people of a certain age. You could have bought me a bucket machine again. Oh, it's this. That's why Amazon partnered with AARP to present the new Amazon Echo Silver, the only smart speaker device designed specifically to be used by the greatest generation. It's super loud and responds to any name even remotely close to Alexa, so they can find out the weather. Allegra, what is the weather outside? It is 74 degrees and sunny. Huh? It is 74 degrees and sunny. Where? Outside. What about it? The temperature outside is 74 degrees and sunny. I don't know about that. The latest in sports. Correct. How many did old Satchel strike out last night? Satchel Page died in 1982. How many did you get? Satchel Page is dead. Is what guy? Died. Who did? Satchel Page. Ah. I don't know about that. We have local news and pop culture. Manila, what the boys are doing across the street? They are just playing. They what now? They are just playing. You say they just playing now? Yes, they are just playing. I don't know about that. Pass the smart devices like your thermostat. Alessandra, turn the heat up. The room is already 100 degrees. Are you trying to kill me, Alizé? The new Amazon Echo Silver plays all the music they loved when they were young. Angela played black jazz. Playing, uh, jazz. <laughs> It also has a quick scan feature to help them find things. Emilia, where did I put the phone? The phone is in your right hand. And it has an uh-huh feature for long rambling stories. So then I gave him five dollars. And he said I only gave him one dollar. Uh-huh. I said, I know I gave you a five. Uh-huh. Because I only had a five and a one only. Uh-huh. And this is one dollar right here. Uh-huh. So I mean you tell me who's crazy. Amazon Echo Silver. Get yours today. I say get yours today. To order Amazon Echo Silver, send a check or money order to Amazon.com right now. So, okay, I think uh, the video pointed us to some of the challenges and also to some solutions for better acceptance, I think. And uh, yeah, Sven, can you tell us a little bit about the acceptance sure. today? Okay. 
Here. The biggest challenge. Okay, so hello everyone from my side. Um, we already met um, on Monday at the panel discussion. I already um, anticipated a, a couple of facts that I will present to you today. Um, but I think I, I can now present them to you in a more precise manner. Um, and let's first talk a bit about acceptance. Um, Acceptance is an issue, uh, especially in Germany, we already talked about that. So um, I don't know if you are aware about the distribution um, of voice assistance in Germany at the moment. What would you guess how many people have uh, a voice assistant in their households at the moment? What would you say? How many, how many percent? Two million people, let me calculate that in percent. Yeah, okay, thank you, yeah. I would have estimated 10, something about one to two million people. Okay, so um, if you look here, this is um, the newest numbers. It's um, from one of our representative surveys. It's 6% it's of um, people above 14 years. So um, yeah, I mean, if it's, it's a bit higher than than what we would expect. Um, so, but it's still pretty low. 6% uh, is pretty low. So we would probably ask us, why are we even talking about this? So um, for a contrast, I will show you the figures um, from the US. These are the figures um, for 2018. Um, and they are um, uh, collected by the uh, NPR uh, public um, broadcasting. Um, so that is 21% in 2018, um, which is um, uh, much larger, almost uh, three times as many people. And it's increasing tremendously. So if we look at the newest figures, these are figures from Microsoft. That we probably have to take them with a grain of salt because they are from Microsoft and probably not that independent because they are involved in, in Cortana. But if we look here at the figures of 2018, they were at 23%, which is pretty much 21% from, from the other survey. But now they, they got up to 45% uh, in 2019, which means that almost every other person has um, a voice assistant uh, in their household. And, and that is, uh, for me, that is, yeah, quite astonishing. And um, yeah, we have no reason to assume that this is going to stop there. So it's probably increasing uh, quickly in the next years. And uh, as with Twitter, it will come over to Germany. But we, of course, we have to think about why is the reason that in Germany or other parts of, of Europe, Western Europe, um, acceptance figures are still that low. Um, another interesting thing is uh, habitualization. So a lot of people, they say, yeah, well, I, I, got, I got a voice assistant in the beginning and I talked to it a lot and then my interest dropped. Um, so uh, one hypothesis is that you lose interest over time. But if we look at the figures, that's exactly what, what people were asked in the US. Um, in, in contrast to the beginning, uh, do you use um, your smart speaker more often or less often? And we see that the majority uses it more often. Um, so we can at least yeah, not support the hypothesis that interest drops over time. Um, it's actually the contrary. Um, we are more interested in that. But these are, again, figures from the, from the US. Um, then what are people asking um, smart uh, speakers? And here we have different types of, of question. There, um, if I'm not mistaken, people should uh, uh, decide what would be their favorite requ requests. And the favorite request is searching for a quick fact. That's pretty broad, but um, two thirds of the, of the population would, would tick, tick that box. Asking for directions, we talked about that on Monday as well, is, is also pretty, pretty favorite. Um, but this is 
searching for product service is, is um, uh, more than 50%, but again, this is a Microsoft study, so they might be interested in asking that question and having high numbers for that, for that rating. But this is what people were generally asked, what, what are your favorite requests? And um, in the next studies, a study, people were asked, what, what do you actually ask Alexa? So that, that's a difference. Um, because the first one would be like, what I would like to ask Alexa, and that is what I actually ask um, Alexa, or I say Alexa for, for voice assistance because it's short, but you know that I also mean Google Home and Bixby and all the others. Okay, so a lot of them use it, use it for playing music. So this is like, like one of the actual most important requests. Um, and I think I can, I can second that from my own experience. Um, that is what, what I used my, my smart speaker the most for, is playing music. And a lot of people, they say that, that their um, music usage has increased uh, due to Alexa. They use music much more than they used it before because it's so easily accessible. Uh, getting the weather, I can also second that. Um, so so that, that's a bit of a difference. Um, and I think these, these figures are more reliable than the others. Um, answer a general question, however, is also very popular, very popular here. Okay, so if we look at the, the picture from Germany, we, we find a pretty similar, similar thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what is interesting here is they made a difference between the younger generation uh, here and the total generation uh, population there. But it's not so much of a difference. Um, the, the only things we can see here is that, that the younger um, generation, they use the smart speakers more for getting information uh, than the older generation. They probably use other sources for information uh, like yeah, they use search engi engines on their laptop um, or they use m maybe even paper or books or something like that. Um, yeah, and what is also important is um, that it's used for, uh, um, for voice messages uh, in, in messenger services uh, like, uh, like WhatsApp. So um, that is a, a really common feature uh, here in Germany. I don't know if that is a unique feature in Germany because, but it's, it's the most popular here and especially among the younger people. Um, it's very important. So maybe we can talk about that later on. Okay. So you are all concerned with developing skills. So I, I thought it might be interesting for you. This is the number of, of skills people use if they use a smart speaker to control their household devices they use uh, an average of 16 skills per week, per week, which I think is pretty, is pretty elaborate number, it's a pretty high number. Okay, um, then uh, people were also asked about general features they would, they would like to have introduced, and, and this is not a complete comprehensive picture at all, but just to give you an impression, I mean, more than the majority would be interested in a, in a smoke alarm feature, so, so when the smoke alarm goes off, then uh, it would uh, automatically or semi-automatically call 9-11 uh, 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 for you. And another one is, um, which I think is really interesting, that uh, 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 at least a, a quarter of the population, every fourth person, says that they would be interested in having a smart speaker feature that detects mental health issues. Uh, when you talk to it. So that would actually uh, recognize um, depression or suicidal tendencies in you and then, I don't know, what, doing what, um, I don't know, um, making an appointment with a psychotherapist or something like that. Um, so yeah, so this is um, uh, what I can provide you with the newest figures. Um, um, I think there are some that are, most of these figures are pretty positive, but this, this figure is maybe a bit more yeah, pessimistic. Um, more than two, two thirds of the population, they agree that they don't know enough about their smart speaker yet to use all their features. So there is a, a, a pretty low awareness, even in the US, 
about what the smart speaker actually can do. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I think this is a really interesting question in the sur German survey. It's kind of hidden in the text, so you really have to look after it to find it. Um, they asked people, did you try to have actual conversations with your smart speaker? And 12% and of the people only tried to do that, and 8% and uh, were, were satisfied with that dialogue. So, so the dialogue function is still uh, very low in acceptance. So just to give you a, a general overview about the newest figures uh, concerning voice assistance uh, in uh, Germany and the US, and uh, now I will hand over to Peter again. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, N uh, let's now look from the technical side as uh, at one of the most basic um, yeah, of the basic features of a voice assistant, and th that is the speech recognition. So the speaker first has to recognize the speech in order to do something useful with it. And uh, so many people assume the problem to be solved. Um, because when we look at the top uh, scores or the lowest word error rates achieved over the years, we see a tendency uh, that the recognition rate is um, achieving or even uh, exceeding a human performance. So we can uh, see that here. So these are different uh, times. This uh, here, the left bars here, are uh, for different uh, corpora used for speech recognition before or in 1997. So that was still, a, was still an early stage of speech recognition technology. And here, um, the gray bar are the wor uh, uh, word error rates for automatic speech recognition and the blue bars are the word error rates for human speech recognition. So they were tested on the same corpora and speech. And here we see, um, so the technical systems, the gray bars, they always had a word error rate about factor 10 higher than the human listeners. So in 2012, that, was, uh, that didn't change so much. 2012 was about when this uh, deep learning uh, um, deep learning approaches uh, gained some momentum, uh, but it was not yet at, at the stage we have today. And so uh, we still have a superiority of the human listeners with uh, rather small recognition rates, but here uh, they use now much larger corpora, so more, diff more difficult task with more uh, complicated words to recognize, and therefore it's altogether a little, little higher. And when we now look at 2017, so two years ago, then we see, okay, the word error rate or word recognition error rate of human listeners is actually uh, a little higher than of the automatic systems. So, but this is, uh, uh, the systems that were compared here are the top scoring or the best performing automatic speech recognition, uh, uh, recognition systems that were available at that time. Um, but that doesn't mean that holds for all languages. Yeah? So these systems were only developed for languages uh, where many, many resources are available. That means uh, lots of uh, big text corpora which have been annotated and segmented. And that's uh, labor intensive work that has been done uh, just for few languages like American English, uh, German a little bit, and so on. But when we uh, look at languages uh, which are not spoken by such a big population, uh, the performance actually drops significantly. And the same holds for dialects um, in some languages, so especially when foreign uh, people speak English, for example, uh, the recognition rate is also uh, not what we see here. Yeah? So humans are still much better and they just can e more easily and more quickly adapt to certain dialects, uh, for example, in a language. Uh, they have never heard before even. Um, so, uh, speech recognition itself, so it's not a really solved problem yet, at least for many languages. Um, but uh, one of the more severe problems, in my opinion, is prosody. Uh, so, and I mean the understanding and the synthesis of prosody. Prosody itself refers to the elements of speech that are not directly tied to individual phones 
uh, but they are suprasegmental, uh, as, as you can say, so they are tied to uh, the level of uh, syllables, words or phrases. And prosody includes many aspects like intonation, so the melody of a spoken utterance, the speech rhythm and stress. And prosody can also be divided into uh, uh, for, uh, three categories. And one is phonological prosody. That is a prosody that we generate um, related to the phonological structure of the utterance. So when we have an utterance in a text form and we know nothing else about the context, all we can do is just read it in a neutral way. And that, it, uh, that is what uh, phonological prosody refers to. Uh, paralinguistic pro uh, uh, prosody goes a little further. So here, this is a uh, prosodic element, speech melody rhythm, uh, that is not in the text, but that, is, uh, that conveys yeah, nuanced meanings, emotions, speaker traits, age, health, condition, and so on. So these are all paralinguistic uh, properties. And there's a further category that is pragmatic aspects, and that goes even further, and that intends to convey the intentions uh, with which utterances are produced. Uh, for example, when I say something like, uh, Alexa, uh, das Wetter gestern war noch, uh, then Alexa should recognize, oh, ne? it should be Alexa's turn now. She should, uh, she, uh, should answer me now because I'm just uh, making a long pause or uh, uh, making a long syllable at the end. Uh, and that is a prosodic marker for turn taking. Yeah? So that Alexa can answer me now. But uh, current speech synthesis systems, also the Alexa voice, is mainly using phonological prosody. So paralinguistic things like the expression of emotion or even pragmatic prosody are not dealt with yet. And I uh, can briefly show you here an example of uh, the pr uh, possible ways of producing prosody for one and the same written sentence. Yeah? So the sentence is a German one here, du fährst in die Berge. I can uh, say du fährst in die Berge in a lot of different ways. And these are spectrograms here of the utterance. And what you see as a blue curve here, these are the intonation contours. So the, the rising and falling of the fundamental frequency that we use. And when I speak du fährst in die Berge, uh, just neutrally, du fährst in die Berge, so spoken by myself, you see du fährst in die Berge. Yeah? Okay, the blue curve goes like this. So I could also ask it as a question, du fährst in die Berge, du fährst in die Berge, so and you see the blue curve has a very different course from, from my statement. And um, when I uh, say it here as, uh, uh, as an exclamation, uh, then it uh, sounds like this. In die Berge. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I want some, someone to, to uh, drive into the mountains. And you see the blue curve is different again. So these are all different intonation contours for one and the same sentence. I can also, so when I, when I want to express that you drive into the mountains and you are not going or walking, yeah, then I put an emphasis on fährst, and we see an, an accent here, so a rising F0 on fährst, but I can also do it in two different ways. Yeah? Every time emphasizing the, the word fährst. Du fährst in die Berge. So du fährst, you don't walk. Okay. Du fährst in die Berge. Yeah? So both times fährst was emphasized, and we see the difference in the contours. Or um, even uh, a question where I want to know, do you drive or do you go? So I would then ask, du fährst in die Berge? So do you drive and do you not go into the mountains? Yeah, fährst in die Berge? And you see, this is a real problem. How to predict these blue curves, these intonation contours for all the different kinds of ways in which we can speak an utterance. So, uh, but, that's not the only problem. Even for the normal linguistic prosody, we have a problem. And that's uh, related to the semantic parsing of an utterance. When we have a sentence like this, yeah, policeman helps dog bite victim. Uh, we could read it as I just did. Yeah, the policeman helps the dog to bite the victim. Or we could uh, read it like policeman helps dog bite victim. Yeah? He helps uh, the victim that was bitten, uh, that was bit by a dog. So, 
Uh, this is just uh, linguistic prosody, but we need good parsing. We, we need to understand the meaning. That is also one of the challenges of, um, uh, of current speech synthesis and uh, recognition. And also the speech recognizers. So w when we can produce better prosody uh, and we understand more about it, also the recognition can benefit from that because then the speech recognizer can better understand our moods, our intentions turn-taking, intentions, and so on. Okay, so I think this is a little technical part and we will now ask, can we actually trust? So I will follow the same approach as I already did in the first part. Um, I will try to illustrate that question by means of of survey answers uh, that we have um, for that particular uh, point. Um, so the point is, can we uh, trust uh, voice assistants? And um, of course, m a lot of people, the people that have a high technology affinity, they would say, of course we can. You know, it's a technology and it's something good and positive. But um, we know from experience that people have a, a deep, um, emotional relation to technology and it's an ambivalent uh, relation that they have and uh, there's this pretty old text from Mick and Fournier um, it's already 20 years old but it's still pretty relevant today and it shows that there is this fields of tension between different uh, things that are related to technology and um, technology can always cause uh, control or um, increase control but also chaos um, it can uh, increase activity, but also passi passivity. Um, it can be new or obsolete. Um, so I don't want to go into detail here, just to illustrate that the effect of technology can also be uh, good or bad, or sometimes even neutral. And it's the same for uh, voice assistants. There is this survey uh, that has been published uh, last year among uh, the German population, and I found it very uh, important people were asked um, um, there is this statement um, the more technology we have in society um, the more people are constrained by uh, uh, technology do you think you can support that statement and if we look here then we see that the, uh, uh, a large majority of the population would say yes technology is a cause of constraint and, and that is quite uh, paradoxical, I think, uh, because technology actually is supposed to help us and to increase our freedom and not to increase our constraints. But this is actually the general mood um, of the population today. There is a certain tipping point at the moment where we have the feeling that the more and more technology develops, the more and more we feel constrained. And that is something that is not restricted um, to yeah, some really sophisticated technology like artificial intelligence or robotics, but of course it also applies to um, smartphones and, and smart speakers. Um, I, I, I brought you that slide from the uh, survey of, of NPR that, that we already had, uh, and uh, it illustrates the barriers of adoption. Uh, people that don't own a smart speaker at the moment were asked, why don't you? And the most important reason was um, the security aspect. They were afraid that hackers could intrude their home and, uh, and, and get some personal information. Um, of course, some people said it's too expensive, but that number is, is, is dropping and it will certainly drop more and more. But more important is um, that a lot of people said um, it bothers you that smart speakers are always listening. And that number even raised dramatically from 36 to 5, 55%. So the, the problem of that always on entity in your home uh, that is always listening is not remedied at all. Uh, at the contrary, it's, it's increasing. Um, it's getting more and more um, important. Um, then um, we also have the problems that um, the government could listen through voice assistance to your private conversation. Um, 
And that is, is also slightly increasing, maybe due to political uh, changes in, in, in recent years um, yeah, in, in, uh, in, in the US. Um, so the people have the feeling that this problem is, is becoming more um, and more severe. So you see that we have that aspect um, of trust and that it, that is really important. Um, and even people that, that have a smart speaker, I mean, these were the, the people that don't own one for certain reasons, but, but even the people that, that have smart speakers in their homes already, more than the majority have the feeling that my personal information is not secure. They use it nevertheless, they use it. But they say they don't think it's secure. Um, and, um, and it's recording me, it's like 41%, you know. Um, so, so these aspects, they, we have to take them very um, seriously. Um, uh, and um, to, to give that a, a bit more of a, a, a positive turn, I, I want to show you that slide um, where we see that um, how willing are people to share their data uh, through the uh, uh, smart assistant. And it's very interesting that, that people they have, um, they make a difference between highly personalized data, um, like name, address, and phone number, and um, not so personal information like gender, age, and email, or their purchase preference, their general purchase preference. Um, and it's very interesting that they are pretty much willing to share their data, especially um, when it comes to, to non, not highly um, personalized data like gender, age, and email. Of course, again, we have to take these results with a grain of salt because they are for Microsoft and their business model is to a certain part based on the willingness of, of the, those people sharing data and the possibility to to um, to produce ads um, out of this, you know. But I'm, I mean, there is this this uh, certainly a bit hidden willingness to 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 give away their data, but it's coupled with a deep feeling of insecurity. Um, and I just want to underpin this with a, a little study that um, that Lisa and Katrin uh, did um, with our students. Um, we did a couple of, of surveys among our students um, and this is um, from a pretty large student sample at this university and we asked them about three uh, dimensions of trustworthiness um, and one is integrity, this is like something like credibility, trustworthiness um, and uh, on a scale from one to seven it's pretty much in the middle. So is that a good result or not? Well, yeah, it's a neutral, neutral result. Um, um, when it comes to competence, are these um, devices, capable devices, can they uh, fulfill their functions? They get pretty positive ratings around, around five and a half and, and five, uh, four and a half and five. Um, but then when we come to intentions, to benevolence, um, there, there is a, a big deficit here. Benevolence means are these devices, um, are they produced to do something good for you? Are they, are they there to help you? Um, do they have good intentions or do the people behind them have good intentions? And here you see that there um, is the largest deficit. The people, they have the feeling that these devices are there and they help them but there is a hidden agenda um, from the producers behind them. They have something else in mind. They want to collect data, they want to make money, um, they want to control them or, or, or something else. And, and this is probably one of the, the biggest challenges um, in, in the distribution of smartphones to address that hidden agenda and find out why people have that. Of course, I can imagine why they have that. Um, and, um, and, and to a certain way um, also counter that. Okay, so just to give you a, a, a short overview over trustworthiness, and now it's Peter's turn again. So, thanks.
Okay, I would now quickly like to talk about uh, the speech uh, synthesis side of the technology and uh, address the challenge, uh, how could we give the speech assistants a personalized, more personalized uh, voice or maybe even a designer voice so that can be the voice of a real person or a voice that we specifically create depending on our demands and that doesn't exist really. Um, currently, you know, Alexa has a standard voice and also Google Home has a standard voice and maybe you can change uh, the, the gender, I don't know really. Um, but uh, the personalization is certainly an open question and you need the right speech synthesis technology to do that. Uh, so, therefore, let's have a look at the uh, technology of speech synthesizer. Typ uh, typically, we classify them uh, in, in two categories. So, first, we have the data-driven synthesizers, and these synthesizers are based on natural speech recordings. So, um, um, yeah, you collect really huge amounts of natural speech spoken by a real person, and then you, you use that in some way to produce your synthesis. So these are rather natural sounding because they are based on the natural speech material, uh, but they are lacking the necessary flexibility to adjust their voice characteristics. Uh, the other category are parametric speech synthesizers. So here you simulate uh, the synthetic voice. This is very flexible, but usually not very natural sounding. So we, it seems like we cannot have uh, both benefits together, naturalness and flexibility. So therefore, let's, let's have a quick look at the history of uh, speech synthesis. Uh, the first commercial, commercially available speech synthesizer was developed by Dennis Klatt, and that was a formant synthesizer. So it's based on the source filter model of speech production. Uh, people had some understanding of how speech is produced and try to mimic that in the computer. So that was the first uh, commercial TDS system then called DEC Talk. And it sounded somewhat like this. Maybe the older people can uh, remember that. Uh. Text-to-speech systems are beginning to be applied in many ways, including aid for the handicapped, medical aid, and teaching devices. The first kind of aid to be considered is a talking aid for the locally handicapped. A co okay, I think. Uh, sorry, computer could speak like that. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, and also the, the old sound cards in the old computers also have that included in hardware. So a speech synthesizer, form and synthesizer like this. Um, and it's understandable, so you can, uh, it's intelligible, but not really natural. So there's something missing that, that makes good naturalness. And then people tried and tried until, the 1985, uh, until 1985. And then uh, they had the idea, okay, let's concatenate real natural speech samples and then make more natural sounding speech. And, uh, okay, the idea is, is not very strange, yeah? You could have the idea, uh, you could have had it before, but um, researchers had a problem to concatenate natural <coughs> speech units before, uh, so that you did not have any uh, distortions as the concatenation points of these speech units. And uh, only uh, in 1985, there was a method uh, invented, which is called PSOLA, Pitch Synchronous Overlap and Add. And that is a method that allows you to make distortion-free concatenation of real speech units. And that's why uh, uh, it developed here. And then the first systems based on natural speech sounded like this. An den Wochenenden bin ich jetzt immer nach Hause gefahren und habe Agnes besucht. Dabei war eigentlich immer sehr schönes Wetter gewesen. Yeah, okay, it's more natural sounding. Uh, you can also understand, but still not totally realistic. So this is a so-called diphone synthesizer. Here you have a very limited uh, inventor of units that you concatenate. And then uh, from the late 1980s, people started to use all available units on a large corpus of many hours of speech and um, invented the so-called unit selection speech synthesis. And here uh, you have, for example, for each phone, many instances. Yeah? For example, the, for the phone R, you have an instance, uh, or you have instances from multi-different pitches of uh, also for an R spoken in very different contexts. And you always select for your synthesis this R which just fits your needs or is needed for the synthesizer or for the text. So this uh, got better. Liebe Freunde, willkommen. Also, ich wollte euch eine interessante Neuentwicklung zeigen, aber zuerst... Uh, 
wie geht es Ihnen? Okay, and you see here they also inserted some fillers to make it more natural, but it rather sounds a little strange here uh, at this place. So, uh, so this was mainly, it is still, I would say, the main uh, technology for speech synthesis unit selection. It is just uh, about to change towards end-to-end -to -end speech synthesis systems uh, using deep neural networks. They are currently under development and already employed for some languages. Uh, I think for the, for the uh, English Alexa, they are already using an end-to-end -end system, which was invented only three years ago. Yeah, so, and that was a big uh, shock, I would say, for the speech community. That's just a big neural network, which takes uh, as an input graphemes, that means letters, and outputs an audio waveform. And you don't need to know anything in between. So uh, it's just training a big net network from text to audio. So this is the idea, yeah? Use deep neural networks to generate the speech audio waveform directly from the normalized input text without the need for explicit models for phonetic transcription, intonation, duration. That all comes from the data. The network is learning it automatically. And uh, these systems, the first systems, achieved MOS scores of 4.5, yeah? And recordings of real speech uh, have a MOS score, so a naturalness score of 4.6, so they are very close, but when you look closer also at the publications, at the current work, there's a drawback. Uh, for example, here in this paper, uh, it was written, our system has difficulties pronouncing complex words, such as decorum or merlet, and in extreme cases, it, it can even randomly generate strange noises. Yeah, so that means it reads the text and suddenly, <laughs> and then it restarts again, uh, something like this. So they are not predictable at all. It's just training. Uh, but people have difficulty pronouncing complex words as well. Two, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they don't turn into noise. They, they try no, then. <laughs> the, first, the first part. Yeah, yeah. Like Malo. Or Th like that's that. true, yeah, that's true. No? Which are, uh, which, which are uh, seldom words with a low frequency in the languages. That's, that's true. They usually speak it slower than these, these words. And uh, this system behaves a little different. And, uh, okay. Uh, they cannot generate audio in real time, but that's just a matter of time. And they always sound a little uh, noisy. So when you listen very carefully with earphones, then they always sound a little uh, noisy, and that is due to the quantization of 8-bit that they usually use. So they calculate distribution on the uh, samples of the output audio, and that's usually 256 uh, samples. But this, that just as a, as a side uh, a note, here are examples, and in a room like this, it sounds really perfect or nearly perfect. Oops. Basilar membrane and otolaryngology are not autocorrelations. Yeah, well. The buses aren't the problem. They actually provide a solution. Yeah, no? Okay. Perfect examples. And uh, here's, uh, <laughs> at the bottom is how it really works. You have normalized input text. That means input text where already numbers are converted into into written text. Yeah, for example, a two period that would be uh, already written out into second, yeah, or zweiter, and things like this. And uh, um, email addresses and so on, this will all be converted to written text. That is a normalized input text. Then we have sequence to sequence models with attention, which are now used to create mel scale spectrograms. That is an auditory representation. And this representation is then used by uh, another neural network, a decoder neural network, to produce the samples of the audio waveform directly. Yeah? Okay, but there's another way to generate speech. So the, these end-to-end -end neural systems, they are, uh, you can say, ignorance-based systems. You don't need to know anything about phonetics. Yeah, you just uh, give audio and uh, have a transcription. And there's also the other way, and that is simulating speech. And that's uh, a thing we are working on at our institute. And therefore, you need to understand how speech is produced. Yeah? So, and uh, the source fil filter theory developed in the 1960s says you have an excitation signal, for example, this peri periodic acoustic signal that is generated here at the glottis, uh, at the, uh, in the larynx. And this uh, signal is fed uh, through the vocal tract filter. That is an acoustic filter here, the vocal tract. And you have another filter, the radiation characteristics, and out comes the speech signal. And the um, challenge here is to model 
the source signal and the vocal tract filter and how it changes over time. So I don't know if everybody is familiar with uh, what we are doing when we are speaking. Therefore, I briefly show you a video here how our vocal folds vibrate when we speak. So it's just two folds that vibrate. It's an endoscopic view of our larynx. Okay, yeah. And here we see the left and right vocal fold. And that's the trick here. No, we look into the trick here. So. Okay, and this was also strob uh, strobocopic, uh, stroboscopic video, so this was not, uh, this, so normally the vibration is much faster. This was just to reduce the vibration frequency. Normally it's so fast that we can't see with the naked eye. Okay, so this is what our voice source is doing, and we can model it, and uh, many models have been developed, and uh, it's, uh, one class of these models are biomechanical models. So we try to abstract what is happening here on a biomechanical level using, for example, these uh, spring mass models. Yeah, so this, this is a vocal fold here, and this can vibrate to the left and to the right, and then open and close the glottis. Or here are different uh, variants of that. We can also have multi-mass models, so in the dorsoventral direction, multiple masses which are linked to each other, and then they can produce very complicated vibrations. And uh, there are also some finite element models, which are very time-consuming consu to simulate. Okay, on the other hand, what is the filter doing? So this is uh, our vocal tract in a real-time MRI uh, situation where sounds are spoken, and you can see how the tongue moves, yeah? the tongue and the velum and the larynx and the lips uh, during speaking. Oh, a little annoying. Well, this is what it looks like when you say pa pa pa. This is ta ta ta. Yeah. Yeah, and you see, so every sound has its individual signature, so to say, you know, or biomechanical configuration. Uh, and uh, the idea of, of articulatory speech synthesis, of simulating this, is to make an abstract model that uh, represents what you are doing. And therefore, your air-filled cavity here in the, in the mouth, in the pharynx, in, in, in the trachea, in the nasal cavity, that is represented in terms of a tube model, as you see it here. And uh, this consists of uh, many sh short, tiny cylindrical tube sections, and they are modified depending on the geometry of the vocal folds and the vocal tract. And uh, so uh, we uh, made in the past a model of the, of the vocal tract, which can be seen here, so that configures the air volume, uh, our acoustic filter, and there's also a self-oscillating uh, bar mass model of the vocal folds which are driven by so-called gestural scores, so that defines how the parameters of the models change over time, and then we can uh, uh, yeah, get the parameters of the tube model and uh, simulate speech with an acoustic simulation. And uh, this looks like this. So we, have, we, we will see here the movements of all the articulators, and then here's a calculated sound. So it's nothing recorded, it's completely a simulation of speech. Das Computermagazin CT berichtet über neue Wörter. So it's a German utterance. Could anybody understand? Das Computermagazin CT berichtet über neue so Wörter. It means a computer magazine CT uh, reported on, on new printers. Uh, there's another example here. Oops. One, one back. Immer noch ist die Paläontologie auf Zufallsentdeckungen angewiesen. Okay, it's just another uh, example. So it's not perfectly natural yet. Uh, uh, but uh, we, are, we are getting closer. And we have here the full flexibility because we, control, we can control every aspect of the speech production. I will show you a few examples which are easy to do. So when, when we have this neutral speech, like, like here, das Computermagazin CT berichtet über neue Wörter. we can very easily make the voice more angry sounding by just changing the properties of the laryngeal model. And for example, like this. Das Computermagazin CT berichtet über neue Wörter. Or we can make a whispery voice. Das Computermagazin CT berichtet über neue Wörter. It's just also setting one parameter at the, for the excitation. 
or uh, we can close the na nasal cavity here yeah, as if you have uh, a cold. Nasal cavity is closed. It's very easy to do here. Das computer so, or you can make a, a drunk speaker for, I don't know, what you can eat it for. <laughs> oh, this is an attempt of a happy voice. Das computer CG, da über neue yeah, okay, things like this are very easy to do. And uh, so the, the Alexa voice, for example, would have a very hard time to do a similar thing. Uh, and therefore, I think there's still room for different systems. Um, yeah, okay, good. But now let's go to distraction, another social aspect. Yeah, um, I mean, in my two previous um, presentation parts, we talked about mainly about perception, but now we talk a bit about effects of smart speakers and and one of the main effects that we can anticipate is distraction because we know that people are highly distracted by smartphones and smartphones are in various regards pretty similar to smart speakers um, so there is research on smartphones that shows that um, putting smartphones on the table um, for everyone to see normally reduces um, mental capacities uh, cognitive performance um, reduces the conversation quality that we have um, and even if you take the smartphone and put it in your bag under your table then um, the smartphone still exercises some influence from under the table from inside your bag on you and reduces maybe your conversation quality and what we try to find out it is if we can replicate that finding from research um, for smart speakers as well and we did some experiments in our um, in our uh, laboratory here you see some uh, pictures that we have we have a, a smart home lab that is uh, that looks like a, a living room um, and these are um, student participants and they are supposed to do um, some cognitive task here they um, are supposed to do some mental calculations and then we have an, a, a treatment um, such as this uh, uh, Emerson Echo Show device. Um, and, and we try to find out if there is an influence of that device on their, on their uh, cognitive task. Um, and um, to make that a bit more scientific, um, we have normally two groups. We have an uh, experimental setting where we have the device we want to test, the smart speaker, uh, and then we have a control group where we have some other device that looks familiar um, um, and that looks similar to the, the smart speaker, but it's not the same. Um, we have, um, in, in some of our experiments, um, we have uh, digital picture frames uh, that look pretty similar to the Emerson Echo Show. Uh, in other experiments, we have candles that look pretty similar to, to normal um, Emerson Echoes without the show um, feature. Um, and I, I can show you some um, preliminary results that we have. Um, here you see uh, we measured um, the number of correct mental calculations. Um, uh, the students were supposed to uh, subtract a number from a higher number uh, for 60 seconds and then we just calculated the correct answers. Um, and on average um, they could more or less do something like 10-ish, yeah, 11-ish. Uh, correct answers um, on total and uh, we see here is the dig digital picture frame and then we have the Amazon Echo show um, and you can see um, in total that is the, the dotted line the black dotted line that the number of correct answers dropped from uh, 11 and a half to a bit under 10 so that is like one and a half uh, uh, correct answers less in our sample size um, it, we have 30 participants in each group because it's very difficult to recruit these people. Um, this didn't turn out to be significant, you know, you need larger groups to test if that is, um, if that is a random effect or if that is an actual effect. Um, but what we could see is that there are significant effects if we look at certain subgroups. Uh, and we distinguished between people with a high technology affinity 
and people with low technology affinity, which means um, technology affinity is um, how you like uh, technological devices, how prone you are to approach them, to use them, to buy them, um, to experiment with them. And people that have a high uh, technology affinity, that is the green line, they seem to be influenced by um, the smart speakers much more. Um, they, they dropped from 13 to uh, eight and a half. Um, so, um, and the other people that, that have low uh, technology affinity, they even got better uh, when they were confronted with a, a smart speaker. So what we see here is um, a, a preliminary indication for a differential effect um, of smart speakers. That means that it depends if you, what kind of person you are. If you are a person with high technology affinity or with low technology affinity, then the smart speaker may distract you in a different way. And um, we did some other study um, about conversation quality. So in this case, the students, they didn't have to to do mental calculations, they just had to talk to each other and then we measured the perceived conversation quality and we, we found out that also here, um, so here on the scale you see the quality of the, the conversation which is on average pretty high um, and here you see for the total there's no difference. But again for people with high technology affinity the conversation quality drops a bit. Yeah. I mean, we, we shouldn't have too high expectations of this, of this experimental setting because it was a really short uh, period of time um, and, and it was really supreme to have this, this smart speaker and the table sitting there, so we shouldn't expect too high of effects, but they are still concernable here. Yeah, question? Okay, um, the first part is quality. So you, you were asking how we define quality. I mean, there are established scales in, in psychology about conversation quality. There are different items. Um, I, I really like the conversation. I found it interesting. I didn't find it boring and so on. So, and then we, we normally we produce a mean, a mean index out of that. Um, the second one, the pairs. Of course, there were different, different pairs, um, but we controlled for a lot of uh, variables like the closeness of the people and and stuff like that. So we try to, to take that uh, into control. Um, and your third question was? Ah, yeah. If, yeah, it was introduced in a certain way. So it was primed in the beginning. So the, the, the participants, they, in the beginning, they, they had a little interaction. So there's a, a voice assistant there. Um, so they were aware that the device is there. But not, it was not prompted really strongly, so only very yeah, um, subtly. Um, yeah, so, and what we, what we are now trying to find out is how is this distraction, I, I mean there seems to be a certain kind of distraction, but even the, the large body of research about smartphones is not really sure how this distraction works. So we know that smartphones distract us, but how do they do that? I mean, why are we distracted by smartphones? Because we have the feeling that we should constantly check them, or because we have the feeling that someone could constantly call us? Um, uh, we don't know, and there is really few research, little research on, on this, and, um, and that is the reason why we did a, a third study, and we're still in the uh, still work in progress, we're still finding out, where we try to disentangle that concept of distraction a bit more and, and we ask the people, how are you distracted? There are different ways of being distracted by smart speakers. Um, uh, one, one possibility is that, that you think about the, the functions that the smart speaker has. You just think like, oh, what a cool device. What, what could it possibly do? Oh, maybe I should buy one, uh, yeah, something like that. So you are cognitively engaged with that. Or there's another kind of distraction. You have the feeling that there is something there, that there is a, a social presence, there is a, a device there, an entity there, 
like a person in the room that distracts you. Or you have the feeling that there is a data security problem, that someone is listening to you all the time. And, and we, we checked that out and we got some really inconsistent results out of that. But what, what I, I can show you here, the, the three items that, that mattered the most were um, here again, you see people that had a digital picture frame here and then an Amazon Echo Show. And the difference um, for these three items were more or less the largest. The first one is I thought about the functions of the device. So people really think about what can it do. You know? so that they, and, and that is the reason why the people with high technology affinity are probably more distracted because they just think more. They think about, ah, it's a cool device, what can I do? But what we expect is that this, this um, uh, effect will probably decrease um, when these devices become more and more established. Because normally, norm today, nowadays, no one would think about a smartphone. Ah, yeah, what can it do? You know, what cool features does it have? You know, and then you are distracted by that thought. You're probably not. This is because these things are new and we have the feeling that they this effect will probably fade over time, but we're not, we not sure yet. Then I felt the device could have contacted me anytime. I think this is like a really important thing um, because that applies not only to smart speakers, but to smart home devices and IoT devices in general. You have the feeling that there's always the possibility that there is an input from the device, a notification. You can always be notified, whatever you do, you know? And that, that gives you a certain stress level, a, a baseline of stress level. And uh, we, we definitely have to, to check that out further. And then the third one I found the, more, the most interesting is I felt forced to give voice commands to the device. So people have the feeling that because it's there, I have to interact with it. You know, there's a certain expectation there that I should do something with it, you know, um, and I, I should use it. Uh, and I think this is a really different third part that has been um, yeah, neglected in, in research so far. So we are now at the moment, um, we are preparing a, a, a third round of studies with our students and we will um, explore these, these problems any further and explore the concept of distraction. And I am happy to show you some, some more um, results about that in the future. Okay, so that was for my part, and now the final part of Peter's awaiting. Thanks, okay. So then we will switch to the very final part of our joint uh, talk, and that's about silent speech interfaces. And silent speech interfaces is like the normal Google Alexa uh, speech interfaces, uh, with the exception that you don't need audible speech. And uh, this is uh, a research field which is still very young. Uh, so it emerged so about 10 to 15 years ago. And uh, it has some interesting applications and that's why uh, it is done. And that's why also we in our lab developed some of these techniques and uh, work with these. So, uh, so what does it refer to? Um, first, silent speech interfaces, that means speech communication without making audible sound. So it's a kind of lip reading. And uh, why should this be useful? We see some, some application pictures here. So one is, of course, here's a, the uh, guy here at the airport. When you uh, are in a loud, noisy environment and there are many people around you and you want to, say, uh, dictate an SMS, so you don't want that everybody else listens. And you want also that the device understands you. So if, if uh, the speech recognition is not depending on audible, so on, on audio, on sound, then that would be good. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, uh, a clinical aspect here. There are patients which don't have a larynx, yeah? so they need a kind of substitute voice. They don't have the voice box here uh, in their throat anymore, can't speak, and also they would benefit from a device that captures somehow their speech movements and then translate it, uh, translate it into speech, yeah? into audible speech. Current uh, devices for these uh, for these laryngectomies, as they are called, 
uh, are not very satisfactory. So I tried one of these devices myself, that is a kind of voice generator that you put on your throat externally, and then you can move your uh, uh, tongue and lips and produce speech, but it sounds like this. Maybe one or the other has heard something like this already, and it's a very monotonic voice. Uh, so we could provide people here with a better solution with silent speech interfaces. Uh, also, there are these uh, people like jet pilots or helicopter pilots and people who have to communicate, or even firefighters uh, with masks on their face, also in a very uh, loud environment. And uh, here, acoustic communication is always very hard, and we could improve that. There are two approaches to silent speech interfaces, and they both start uh, with the capturing of speech-related biosignals that can be of different kinds, i show you in a minute. And then you can uh, make a silent speech recognition. That means you try to recognize the spoken words and you represent it as a recognized text. For example, you can dictate an SMS or email. Or you say you make a biosignal to audio mapping and you need low, low latency here so that uh, you calculate the acoustic speech signal from your silent speech movements and you can give immediate feedback to the user. So with a little knob in the ear and uh, the person can hear what it silently said. So these are two routes and you can do uh, both with uh, good biosignals. So there are some uh, approaches which have been presented in the past. One, for example, is uh, um, ultrasound probe, which you put be below your chin and which images the tongue. Yeah, this is an image, so the surface of your tongue, that you can image online with a frame rate of, say, 50 or 100 hertz. And uh, you try to detect these, uh, uh, this tongue contour and try to infer the spoken sounds from that. It has some problems because other articulators are missing, like the lips, the velum, they are all not there. Uh, but it works to some extent. You can combine it with a lip camera, for example. Yeah, a camera that films your lip and you, you have additional information. Here's a system that uses electrodes on the skin of your, of your face to capture the little electric signals that come from the movement of your muscles when you speak or move silently, uh, the mouth and the tongue. Or you can uh, yeah, put some uh, coils, little electric coils on your articulators, and when you move, uh, they, uh, there is a current induced in these articulators when you have a helmet that emits electromagnetic waves. So that's very clumsy. So uh, uh, another way around is that you put some little magnets on your tongue and on your lips, and you have a pair of glasses with magnetic field sensors, and they track what you are doing. Or they, they you induce, by your speaking, you produce a changing electro, uh, magnetic field that is captured by the, by the pair of glasses. So there are different approaches, but all of them have drawbacks. None of them is, uh, or, or none of them is at the same time convenient, non-invasive, portable, and robust. Yeah, and that's what we would like to have for a good silent speech interface. And here I very briefly uh, show you two concepts we are working on to improve the situation. One is uh, what we coined electro-optical stomatography, short EOS, and the other one is electromagnetic sensing of the vocal tract state. And uh, so EOS is essentially a combination of two previous uh, techniques that have been around for, for quite a while. Uh, so you have a kind of a tooth brace that you put into the, your mouth with electric contact sensors. And you also add some um, optical distance sensors along the midline of this uh, artificial pellet. Yeah, and together, uh, this can capture um, the movement of your tongue and also of your lips. Uh, here is a combined uh, combination picture. So we have a, a flexible circuit board, which is uh, on a base plate, and this contains these contact sensors as well as optical distance sensors. So you can capture all very speech movements to infer what sounds were spoken. Um, and here are some examples. So uh, with this in your mouth, you can also have online feedback of your speaking. Yeah, and these are pictures of your tongue. So this is a hard palate. So the upper roof of your mouth, and you see how the tongue uh, shape um, is measured for different vowel sounds in these pictures, and that represents what we know is uh, correct. Okay, so that was 
Uh, so, so we also did a pilot study, so this is still very new. And uh, we uh, uh, designed a little corpus with 30 words and, and uh, tried to see, okay, uh, can the system, based on these biosignals, detect the 30 words? And therefore we trained uh, a system which is similar to a, a very early speech recognition system um, uh, using feature vectors. Uh, so it's essentially the six uh, distance values that we measure plus four EPG indices at a rate of 100 hertz and then made a kind of nearest neighbor classification and achieved an accuracy of 85% here. So, and it's also possible with this system to directly synthesize speech from the measurement with little latency. So the other uh, um, system that we are currently developing is using microwaves. And for, uh, to this end, so we try essentially to look through the cheek into your vocal tract uh, with microwaves, so centimeter waves, and uh, see what's happening inside the vocal tract. Um, and therefore we use antennas, which we put here and here, and uh, we essentially measure the electromagnetic uh, transmission and reflection properties uh, for different speech sounds. So it's a kind of condition monitoring. Yeah? So when you put your lips and uh, um, tongue in different ways, we will, get, uh, we will get different spectra in the frequency band from 2 to 12 gigahertz. And we use these as features to classify what sound has been spoken. Um, yeah, maybe I switch over, uh, sk skip uh, the corpor uh, corpus, but we essentially did a phone recognition task here with a limited set of, I think, 20, 24 uh, phones. And here, uh, just to give you an idea what it looks like when, you, when we look at the magnitude spectra of the transmission uh, measurements, uh, we get, for example, when you sustain an R and an U, uh, 10 different uh, times, you get, for example, these gray curves for R and the black curves uh, for U. And you can already see with the naked eye, okay, they are really different. And so we can classify speech sounds from this. Uh, for, for the consonants, it's not as clear, but we're still working on that. Okay, and the surprising thing is that we achieved with this technology recognition rates of phonemes of 93% for one uh, subject and 85% of the sec second subject uh, in a very simple, using very simple classifiers. And that's very uh, encouraging because um, uh, the recognition rates of phones from audio signals is actually lower than that. So it seems that we can even uh, uh, get better than audio uh, signal classification. Okay, and here, yeah, why, why is this so low? The 85% the that was me, the subject, and it's probably because of my metal fillings in the teeth, so that radar waves don't go through it. Yeah, and so they are directly ref reflected. Okay, but we are still uh, trying to find out more. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention, and I think we are open for questions. Do you have questions? Uh, this, uh, my question is to Sven. Um, through the metrics that you showed us, um, there are many people who own uh, the uh, significant number of people who own uh, voice assistants in their homes. Uh, they don't know what to do with it most of the time, and they um, they're, they're concerned about privacy as well. But what is driving them to buy those uh, voice assistants in the first place? Is it because of uh, uh, curiosity about tech, or is it because of uh, societal pressure about talking, they, they want to talk about this thing when they're in a group? Uh, so what, what is driving them to buy those uh, voice assistants? Is this a repeat question? Yeah. So you were asking what, what is driving people to buy smart speakers. Um, I think it's a difficult question. You cannot answer that for all the people. But um, what we can say is, I mean, there has been some very prominent research about the diffusion of innovations uh, by Rogers. I think it's still the most cited book in, in social science. Um, and, and it shows that there are some people, they're called pioneers, and they, they buy technological devices just out of curiosity, even if they are not 
not complete yet, or if they are, um, if they have lots of problems. But then there are other people, and they wait a bit longer, and they only buy it when they have the feeling that, that they reached a certain stage of, um, yeah, of elaboration. And what, what I think what we, we experience here now is that that the smart speakers they enter the, the period of of um, early majority um, in that model, and that means that a lot of people um, have the feeling that that this is a trend they shouldn't miss. Um, and a lot of other people have that, and, and there's a lot of advertisement about it, um, and friends have that, uh, and then they they use it as well. Um, and um, yeah, I think we can we can just look back to the, the smartphone experience we had, or our generation had. I think that the processes and the mechanism are pretty much the same here. Um, in the beginning, it's curiosity, but then um, it becomes more and more um, social pressure and um, and, and, and other things uh, uh, there. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a mixture of reasons. Can I add to that? Um, it looks like now Google, at least, goes in marketing a, a different route. They point out that it helps disabled people. So I saw a keynote by a Google person showing a video of a physically impaired person controlling the, the room through smartphone controls. And yesterday in TV there was even one uh, ad just before the news came on uh, an Alexa helping a blind person. So I'm wondering why is this now important for these big players to demonstrate accessibility? Well, I think what we have here, I mean, I can only speculate about this, but what we have is in, in, in advertisement uh, recently is that, that minorities um, play a more and more important role, um, and uh, and and yeah, you see that that the large brands they they make advertisements with mi minority groups um, because they um, they know that the minorities in large parts of the society are well received, and that gives them a, a positive image, you know, because you you always connect them. If you have a Google ad, um, then your subconscious says, ah, okay, this is Google. They are helping the blind, you know. So that raises the the, the brand image that you have for them, and, and it's an, it's an image advertisement. That's 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 what they want to achieve. Um, but that is only speculation. But I would say that that is a reason. And another reason is, of course, a genuine interest because that is definitely a way that you could use the smart speaker. Um, and um, yeah, I think you have both target groups there. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, you, you told us um, about the differences between parametric and uh, data-driven speech synthesis. And I wonder if there's a possibility or if somebody would try to post-process the output of a um, parametric uh, synthesis within your network to do some kind of style transfer or like to, to, to improve the results. Okay, so the question was whether there is a post-processing of uh, unit selection or data-driven synthesis to improve, no, of param parametric synthesis to improve the quality. And uh, um, yeah, it's, no, I don't know about any of uh, such endeavors. And I think it will also not be possible because when you do parametric uh, speech synthesis, um, especially format synthesis, so the early, uh, early version of this kind of synthesis, um, you simply uh, miss to add important features that are perceptually important into the signal. They're really hard to, to be generated afterwards because they also depend on the uh, phonetic categories of the sounds that are spoken. So uh, you would have to include it directly into the synthesis process. Um, so it's, it's really, so uh, in, in the early times people thought when they looked at spectrograms and they, they were looking so noisy, okay, when I reduce all, all the apparent noise, I will get a very, very clean and clear kind of uh, speech synthesis, by performance synthesis. So a kind of superhuman speech, uh, natural speech. But that was not the case. So you need all the detail, all the kind of noise in the voice that is there to, to really sound natural. And um, usually when you have an acoustic waveform of speech, 
if you do any kind of post-processing, it usually only gets worse. So you can add flexibility, of course, uh, change at zero and so on, uh, but it always reduces a little bit of the naturalness of the speech because it, it induces some degradations of the, of the original signals. Okay. Other studies, um, it makes sense that our evolution of the ears and our brain understanding of speech is um, is trained with our vocal cords. Uh, but there are there, if you train a person with a different language, that is, because you have all this funny stuff like these rooms in, uh, in our bones, and you, we, you might not need it. So maybe if we train people with a voice that is not natural, but can we still understand it as good? Is it as good as there a change effect? Or is really, are, are we as biologically, biologically optimized on natural human speech? You know what I mean? Uh, okay, yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. So, so the question is whether uh, it's really necessary to have all the detail in the speech signal that is caused by certain anatomic features of our vocal tracts. And, uh, I think uh, generally to have high naturalness it is because we are overtrained to, uh, to to perceive natural speech and we uh, because we listen to it all the time when we interact with, with normal natural people and so we have a very good sense of what is natural and what is not um, and therefore we detect the slightest deviation from naturalness even if it's just a little jiggle in the F0 or contour of the fundamental frequency or something like this. We, we are very good in detecting that. Um, but uh, you can get used to synthetic speech. So that is uh, well proven. So also when we are working with synthetic speech, with, with articulatory speech, for example, we mix, synthesize some utterances, then change some features, some parameters. Uh, every time we listen, we think it's getting better. Yeah, so uh, yeah, now it's totally perfect. And then you, you get in another colleague from, from next room and say, okay, what does it say? Oh, I don't understand. So, so it's, it's really a short term, uh, you get used, using it, uh, get used to it, yeah. Well, so adding on this, so this effect is also well proven for people who cannot hear. So the devices like cochlear implantates or stuff like this, um, you, they don't understand anything for the first few weeks and then they train on and later on it's for them it's a normal voice and you can see this effect with normal people too. If you show them this voices, they don't understand it, and you can train them to understand it. Later on, it's totally normal for them. So yeah. it's correct to ask whether it's really necessary to generate a totally normal voice, or whether you keep it like this, and people adapt and nevertheless understand it completely clearly. Yeah, I, um, I agree, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is not my, my specialty, but, but maybe um, I think we also have to take into account what you mean by necessary. Because necessary for data transfer, it may not be necessary, you know. But but for emotional reasons, um, it may be necessary. You know, I mean, you may understand everything correctly, but that doesn't mean that you have the feeling that there is a, a natural a natural counterpart on the other side. So um, yeah, maybe it would be even more efficient. Yeah. Maybe a not natural voice could, if you train people long enough, could make us. Uh, take information more quickly per time or something like that. I don't know. Because we, we all saw the paper, I think, that um, different languages have uh, have different a different uh, velocity of speech, but still um, the amount of information is in average the same. So I was wondering um, the the speech if you if you take the natural maybe we can get into Maybe we just get used to it and it's the same, but maybe we can even uh, make more efficient. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are, there are even uh, studies about uh, artificial intelligence, I mean, or algorithms communicating with each other, trying to develop more efficient language systems than we have, and speaking more efficiently among themselves. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are certainly much more efficient ways, but the point is, what is efficient? Um, efficient in terms of if you want to get uh, information through and facts through, then it may be efficient. But if you have, want to have social coherence, 
Oh, if you want to detect, is, is a thing. exactly. Yeah. If you want to detect um, uh, the intentions of your of your counterpart in the speech, if you want to feel nice, uh, 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 then there's a certain different, certainly a different way of efficiency here. And I think this is a this is also a problem with these with these devices. They are very much trained to to get information through, and, and not so much trained to, to the emotional aspect. Um, I'd like to add on that too, because um, you're talking about efficiency and about training people for a very long time so they can get used to it. But I think, especially regarding uh, the voice assistants that we're using now, um, you want to get people to like them at the first try. So um, if the people don't like the voice or they don't understand the voice correctly in the first place, they're much less likely to use them further on. And this is not what we want to reach or what technology companies are going to want to reach. So I don't think this is, this is an approach that will, be, um, that will be used further on because you want to you wanna make them like it the first try. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, so, um, is there uh, any connection um, uh, between uh, the uh, efficiency uh, of a uh, language uh, or a voice and <coughs> embodiment? I'm sorry about the, pri uh, the brain uh, behind uh, the speaker. Uh, I didn't understand. What was the second? Uh, is there uh, any connection uh, between uh, the um, efficiency of a spoken language and uh, uh, the biological hardware, uh, the, the brain? Oh. Okay, that goes into the field of genetics. There are some studies uh, that that uh, that claimed that certain speaker groups from certain parts of the world are better in producing this type of phonemes or tones uh, than other uh, other speaker groups. So, for example, uh, it it was hypothesized or apparently shown that people in uh, in the Far East in, in the uh, in the warm zones uh, with, with a high humidity of the air are, are more likely to be tone languages where you also use intonation to convey meaning. So uh, you use tones like, like Chinese, for example, no, where you also use tones as phonological features. Um, but uh, usually every, every person in the world can learn any language yeah. if he or she is exposed to, to that early enough. Yeah. So th they are still there's still a big argu argument around these studies. Mm. Okay. Final question. So it's a short question. Um, then do you? Um, what's your explanation for the effect you got with the with the not so tech savvy people? I'd say. I mean, they they improved, right? In in the first slide you shown with like by a bigger margin than the other ones decreased. I, I don't see any. Sense on that, I, I can't make any sense of it. So, yeah, I, I mean, the point is that they got probably distracted by the control device, and the control device was the, was the, the picture frame. Oh, okay. So, that, that's what they knew. And the picture frame, they, they thought, ah, it's a picture frame, I know that. Why is the picture frame sitting there? You know? <laughs> and uh, does it change pictures? And oh, nice pictures. You know? And the other people were like, oh, Lemerson Echo Show, how cool is that? You know? So and and I think this is the. the so you think if you put a candle there that they knew, then it wouldn't be wouldn't have any effect on them. Yes, probably Why? not, probably not. But we are still experimenting with this with these treatments, and it's pretty difficult to find a, a perfect uh, a, a control uh, device for that. Um, but I think this is this is one of the uh, one of the reasons. Yeah. Because if you look at the the candle experiment we did, um, that. The effect was not there. You know, it was only for the for the digital picture frame. All right. So we are done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. If thank you, you for your attention. Thanks. If you have any.